start with it. All right. Now, what is this one showing you? It's real quick and easy. It's telling you different types of vaccines, and it's also telling you, A, is it inactivated or attenuated? Because that will help you to figure out, do you want that vaccine? You may want to make that decision, right? For example, I don't know, let's find one. Let's find a good one. Now, here, the, the influenza shot, okay? Yes, the one that's intramuscular, it is inactivated. So the one on your arm, it is inactivated, and it's not supposed to make you sick. Now, there is another type of flu vaccine that you get in the nose. Now, that one is attenuated. Make sense? See the big difference? You may not want to get the attenuated version of the flu vaccine because depending on the person, if they're elderly, right, if they're immunocompromised, you know, if they're pregnant, they may get the flu, right? So it's good to kind of know when you get a vaccine, is it inactivated or is it attenuated? Because if it's attenuated, it means what? You can get sick. You can get sick. Hit it, Faith. Um, I have an old book. Yes. When we do the test, do you think this is much longer than what we have? The old one, do you think this could be part of it? No, on the test, now you might have it on the test. This is really for your own information. Okay. Right? It's really helpful for you to figure out should you get a certain vaccine based on attenuation or what inactivation. Now look down here. All of these vaccines are actually available to you, but it's not really recommended for everybody. It depends on who you are. So, for example, if you're a healthcare worker, you may want to get vaccinated against anthrax or tuberculosis, right? If you're in healthcare, if you're in government, right, you may want to get vaccinated against anthrax. So it depends on who you are. If you're traveling outside the country, some of those vaccines you are required to get, okay? And here's the deal, all right? It's probably smallpox. Well, that's a good issue. Let's bring up smallpox, okay? Smallpox was, quote, eradicated back in the 70s. Literally. So back in the 70s, people said, okay, smallpox is officially eradicated, which means they stopped, literally, they stopped vaccinating people against smallpox. So most of you in here have never received the smallpox vaccine. Even though it's available, you didn't get it. That's scary. You know why? I got it in the military, and that's the only reason. Yeah, that's why government, right? So if you're in the government military, you may get one of these guys, but if you're normal like us, you don't get it, even though it's available. Here's the deal. This is why smallpox is scary, right? Because none of you, except for Milton, are immune to it, which means if you're ever exposed to smallpox, you may get it, and you may die. You may. Yeah. You may die. Nasty. And it was nasty immunization. I mean, the spike. Smallpox. You got, let's see, I mean, it was covered. Everybody had it. Not all like that. Did you get, um, That's not deadly like chickenpox could be? That's deadly. It's deadly. It's painful. It's, it's painful, <coughs> not deadly. So are they the same thing? It's just a question of uh, age of the... Yes. It's age and the manifestation of the virus. So in other words, the chickenpox, you literally have little spots all over your body, and they go away after a while and you lose scars, but it's not painful. It may itch a little bit, but that's about it. Now, with shingles, you don't have rash all over your body. You get bands of rash. It's not like all over. You get a band around here, a band on the back of your neck. So they're like patches of inflammation, really, that are extremely painful. I mean, you may have to take high-dose drugs just for the pain itself, not for the rash, just for the pain, because you can't sleep at night because of the pain. It's painful. That's why I say you should get that vaccine. Even without a, po a pocket, you should get it, unless you want shingles. And here's the deal, I'll tell you. If you've had chickenpox, you are more likely, what, to get shingles. So you can get the vaccine to prevent 
prevent getting shingles. So, so even though you have pox, chicken pox, you can still get shingles? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because that virus stays with you. It's in the nerves. So no matter what, you should get that. That vaccine will prevent that virus from coming back again. So you should get it. Either way, you should get it, unless you want shingles. Because as you get older, the likelihood of you getting it increases with age. And if you've had chicken pox, you're more likely to get it as you get older. All right, anything else about this slide? Uh, not about that slide. Yeah. Just, just for some people, uh, I just love one. Yeah. Uh, hepatitis B, mm -hmm. I found it interesting. Uh, see. Three years ago, they came out that people that had received the hepatitis B, all three series, 35% of the people that took that vaccine did not take it. So what we had to do is take all of our employees and have them tested. And sure enough, we had a percentage that it did not take. So we had to send them back. So a lot of people are not aware of that. So I always tell people, if you can get your hepatitis B, go back in a year or two, be retested. Because you've got a 35% chance you're going to have to repeat the series. Just that's why. Yeah, good information, right? Wow, that's scary. Okay, no people. All right. Now, notice, right? Notice that some of these vaccines are actually attenuated, which means you may not be able to get it, right? It's scary, right? Like yellow fever, for example, I'll tell you, with yellow fever, I could not get that vaccine when I wanted to. I wanted to go back to yellow with my husband. I couldn't get it because in order to go to Cameroon, you have to get the yellow fever vaccine. You got to get it. But at that time, I was pregnant. Make sense? And since yellow fever is what attenuated, which means it's basically alive, I could not get the vaccine, which means I could not go on that trip. I had to stay behind for three weeks because of one thing. That vaccine right there is available, but depending on your situation, you can't get it. Now, vaccine safety, we've been talking about that just now, right? Milton talked about with the smallpox vaccine, have that bad reaction, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, problems with immunization, usually you have a mild toxicity, meaning pain at injection site, right? So there's adjuvants, they can cause pain at the shot, like tetanus shot always hurts, right? It's the adjuvant in that tetanus shot, why? It's basically the toxoid. And you need other chemicals to help boost the immunity against that toxoid, and it hurts. It swells, and it hurts for days, right? That's mild compared to what? Anaphylactic shot, which can kill you, right? So again, if you're allergic to eggs, don't get certain vaccines. You may die. That's a very severe reaction, all right? You may have residual virulence from what? The attenuated viruses. They may come back in full force. That's bad. Now, there have been allegations, right, that certain vaccines autism. There has been no proof to corroborate that allegation. There is no evidence to say if you get a certain vaccine as a kid, you end up with autism. It's not the case. Some parents <coughs> elect not to vaccinate their children, which makes no sense to me, okay? Makes no good sense. Hit it. Yeah, uh, a family friend of ours in New York had a child and then he was okay till he got a vaccine. The next day till now, he's about 11. From the time he was three to 11, he's been having, he's been autistic from three, so they, they were trying to get a settlement from the hospital and doctor and all that, I don't know how he went. And they probably denied the case. They just haven't really, you have cases like that, but I guess it's just not enough proof to say it was actually the vaccine. It could really just be coincidence that, you know, could be, but again, like they didn't get any money up from it, because there's no hardcore evidence to say if you get this vaccine, you end up with autism. We'll see if a genetic disorder. So something is wrong with the person's chromosomes, which means no bacterium and no virus can really affect your chromosome. It's really genetic. It's really genetic. Versus something like cancer, it can be genetic, but chemicals cause cancer, right? UV light causes cancer. X-ray light, X-ray causes cancer. Viruses <laughs> cause cancer. So that's totally different. So autism, okay, that's purely genetic. It's all in the person's chromosomes that something is faulty there. 
So nothing on the outside can cause something like that. So, so you could be born with autism and function normally? And to a certain age. To a certain age, and then when the autism... The manifestations show up. Right. So it's always been there, but the manifestations show up as the child gets older. I figured that if autism was like genetic, that people like it would be strong. No, because there are certain genetic disorders that don't manifest to a certain age. So, for example, I don't want to get into too many genetics, right? But some diseases that you actually inherit don't show up until you're 50 years old. So you've already had those genes, right? In other words, oh gosh, I'm getting tired now. Huntington's disease, okay? No, Huntington's disease. I'm serious, right? It's a genetic disorder, but you don't have manifestations of it until about 45, 50. Chromosome. Chromosome. I mean, like the ones, the, the genetic diseases that don't show up until you're like 45. It's all in the chromosome. It just it manifests when you get older. You've had the faulty gene. It was all it was there in the first place. But in other words, when you actually know that something is wrong, it's just when you're later on in your life. So it just depends on the disorder itself. So it could be true in autism, you may have faulty genes and it doesn't show up until later on. It just gave you honey just right, you're 50 years old. And you find out you've got dementia. That's what happens. You're 50, but you get dementia, which is not usual, but it's a genetic disorder. So we could have a kid, like, I'm looking to the office that's like 15 years old, and he's been a straight A, like, student the whole time, and then all of a sudden he realized he has autism. Usually the onset of autism is early childhood. Adolescent. Yeah, adolescent. Early childhood, when the onset takes place. It's all about onset, right? When you see manifestations of it. That's all. Mercury is a preservative. You asked about mercury, a preservative. Yep. Okay. All right, real quick. This is a good discussion. Passive immunotherapy. I thought we'd get on earlier today. I guess not. I'm tired you. Passive immunotherapy, which means what? You are not, right? It's like chapter 16. You are not actively making antibodies against that pathogen. You actually get preformed antibodies, right? That's what passive means. You get preformed antibodies. Now, why is that needed, right? In other words, you get anti-serum. <coughs> You're like, what's anti-serum? It's serum, right? So serum is basically what comes from blood, and you're taking away the blood cells, and you've taken away the clotting factors, and you're left with serum, and the serum has antibodies in it, Okay, which is now what? Anti-serum, got it? Anti-serum, all right. Now, why would someone get preformed antibodies in the form of anti-serum, right? Why? Well, you may need immediate, right? I mean, right now protection against some disease. Some toxins are very potent. Snake bite? Exactly, so snake venom. I mean, it takes you out within a couple of minutes, right? or hours, within a day, you don't have a month to build immunity, right? You don't have that kind of time. So some toxins like snake bites are very potent, which means you need antibodies right away to neutralize that toxin, makes sense? So that's a perfect example of why you would want what passive immunotherapy, to neutralize a toxin that is extremely potent, and if you don't neutralize it, you have some very bad effects, makes sense? Now here's the deal, even though it's, it's fast acting, right, compared to active immunity, right, active is not fast acting, why? Because your body actually has to respond to the antigen. Remember all of chapter 16? Your body has to do chapter 16, literally. So whenever you get antigens, right, or a virus, or a bacterium in the form of a vaccine, your body has to do the whole chapter 16 to produce immunity, right? And that's not overnight, right? It takes days and months to do all of that. Well, if you get preformed antibodies, it's what? Immediate, but here are the downsides. A, those antibodies may have other antigens. Now, usually, the antiserum may come from another person or horses, which means you may react to what? Horse antigens, make sense? And if you react to horse antigens, that's basically called serum sickness, make sense? Why horses? Well, horses are large animals. They have a lot of blood, which means they can make a lot of anti-serum. Makes sense? So you may get anti-serum with horse antigen, and you react to the horse antigen, and you get sick. 
Also, there may be some viral pathogens or even viral particles that actually contaminate the antiserum, because again, you get it from a horse or another person, so it's basically contaminated. These antibodies that you get, they are degraded. In other words, they don't last a long time in your body. You get the free from antibody, and they do their job, but then they go away, and you never remake them, right? So you have to get repeated antiserum. Every time you get a snake bite, guess what? You gotta get another shot because the last antibodies you've gotten, they're already gone. Makes sense? No memory, right? Exactly. You're putting it all together, right? Because if you're just getting antibodies, you're not doing what? Chapter 16, which means you're not making memory cells. You have no memory. So you need this every single time you're exposed to what? The toxin. No memory is produced. That's a key word, and I like that as a test question. Okay. Now, some of the limitations, just some of them. Some being this one. That one and that one. So one, two, three. These three limitations can be overcome with using hybrid domas. Okay? Hybrid means a hybrid of two things, right? Doma comes from something meaning like cancer. So let's look at that. So in other words, the first three limitations can be overcome with hybrid domas. The last one, we can't do nothing about. Those preformed antibodies go away over time and you never remake them. Now, what is a hybridome? It's a hybrid between a plasma cell. And what's a plasma cell? Yeah, it secretes antibodies. Exactly. So plasma cells secrete antibodies, all right? And a myeloma. Now, I mentioned omas, right? The first one. Yeah, tumor, cancer. So a myeloma is basically a cancerous B cell. So you've got a regular B cell as a plasma cell, right, secreting antibodies, and you're going to fuse it literally with the myeloma, which is now a cancerous B cell. You're like, well, why are we doing that? Okay. Cancer cells are immortal, meaning they never die. They literally divide forever. So you simply make a plasma cell that lives forever. Make sense? That's what you're doing. So a plasma cell that lives forever. Hit it.
and produce antibodies. Make sense? That's his job for life. Now, usually what you do to make sure your hybridoma is working, you put them in little wells, and then you present to the hybridoma the antigen, right? The antigen that you use at the very first step, correct? You want to make sure you now making the same what? Antibody against that very first antigen. Far so good? Now, I'll tell you right now, why do you do that? Because here's the deal. It is a cancerous cell, right? It is a tumor cell. And tumor cells have the ability to change themselves, right? So even though you initially have one tumor antibody, right? Somewhere along the line, he's now cancerous. He may just go rogue and do something completely different, right? Right. So you got to make sure that at least one of them is still reacting to what? The same antigen you use to do what? Start the whole process, right? And this guy is showing up positive. You take that guy, right? And then you basically roll him out. And that guy will produce all of your monoclonal antibodies. Got it? Now, monoclonal antibodies, they're actually used in some vaccines like RSV. So RSV is basically a virus that attacks babies. And if they get that vaccine against RSV, it's monoclonal antibodies. That's how they made it. That's how they made it. Real quick, here's the last slide, then you go home. All right. Now, what? I'm trying to get you out of here today. Me too. I'm really, really tired today. It was a bunch of that. Like, now, this slide, what is it trying to tell you? It's trying to tell you the pros and cons of what? Passive Active and passive immunization, right? That's what I'm trying to show you. The pros and cons between active and passive immunization, okay? Let's look at active immunization. Here you got antibody production, IgG and then IgM production. Now they should have put IgM first and then IgG. And why is that? Because it clashes with nothing. Right, because IgM, that's a good test question, right? What's what the first antibody that's always it's made? The yeah, yeah. It's the pentaphor. It's the pentaphor. IgM is always the first one you make. And then you do class switching and you switch over to IgG. Okay, so it should be IgM, then IgG. That's the order of the production. So this is how much you have in your blood. That's your title, right? That's how much you have in your blood. This is what over time. Here is active immunization, like an attenuated virus, for example. See how it's real slow production? Look, this is antibody production. Yeah, real slow, right? Chapter 16. Chapter 16. That makes sense. Your body has to take time to actually do what? Recognize it, right? Respond to it, do all those steps we talked about. That's what you're doing, right? Which means it takes a long time, right? Makes sense? Now, this, you're basically trying to make memory cells, basically. It takes forever. Then, you do a booster. Look at this. When you do a booster, whoop, look at that. Now, why is the reaction so quick when you give the booster? What have you made during that process? Memory, memory cells, right? So this long time here, all you're doing is making memory cells against that antigen, correct? That make it sense? Go back to chapter 16 if it's not, chapter 16. Therefore, when you expose your body to what? The same antigen, right? That's why you have memory cells, because now the response is really quick, right? The memory cells respond very quickly because they've already seen that antigen, correct? And now they go right to work with all the antibodies, right? Through the roof, correct? Because now the memory cells are working for you. They respond to it, they've seen it before, and they're making lots of antibodies. Now, look at passive immunotherapy, okay? Here's the injection. Look at that. All those antibodies, ready to go, right? They are ready to neutralize whatever is in your body, correct? But what's happening over time? Diminishing returns. Yeah, diminishing on your returns, right? So over time, you're good, but as time goes on, you lose all those antibodies, right? They're all gone. What have you not done in what? Passive immunotherapy. Build, build memory. Right. You have not built memory cells, which means no more antibodies. A, you didn't make your own antibodies, but really B, you did not make memory cells, which means you have no memory, and every time you're exposed to that particular antigen, you got to get another shot, okay? It's all over yeah, send a shot every 10 years for the booster, every 10 years. And the question for chapter 17? Okay, you got a quiz tonight. Wish you well. See you Tuesday. Take care. Hit it. So